I'm Dr. Janelle Anderson, former college professor turned manager in a large corporation turned entrepreneur. And not just any entrepreneur. I've made it my life's work to make organizational life more effective and fulfilling. So welcome to Working Conversations, the podcast where we digest and translate research and ideas on workplace dynamics and serve up to you the most interesting and actionable strategies to make your workplace conversations and your relationships more effective, productive, and influential. If you're looking for proven tools for your workplace toolbox, you're in the right place. Now, let's get after it. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Working Conversations podcast. You know, COVID has really upended the way we do work. Here we are 10 months into the pandemic in the United States, and fully remote work settings have become the norm for those whose jobs will allow it. And for those jobs that are not amenable to a full-time remote work schedule, they are oftentimes splitting their time between doing some of those essential services at the office and then working from home the other hours of the week. Now, even when it becomes safe to go back to work in large numbers, it is highly likely that we won't. We won't inhabit office space in the way we did in the past. The prognosticators, the futurists, the senior leaders of our organizations have been discussing this for the last six to eight months, trying to figure out what the future is going to look like. And what they can agree on is two things. The first is that it is not going to look exactly like it did before the pandemic. It absolutely isn't. Because by and large, employees have proven that they are able to be productive. In fact, they're highly productive. We are all highly productive while working from home. That was the big risk going into this is employers thought that their employees would not be able to maintain a level of productivity. And in fact, that risk has been completely mitigated. Employees are cranking out the work like never before. The new risk now is burnout. We'll talk about that in another episode. But the the one thing, the two things that they can agree on, one is that we are not going back to exactly the way things were before. The other thing that those prognosticators, futurists, and senior leaders of our organizations also agree on is that we don't know exactly what it's going to look like when we get back to the office in some shape or form. So I was thinking, since we're going to be here for another long while and maybe forever, let's address some of the things that are not working, especially not working in our virtual meetings. So today we're going to go through the top seven annoying behaviors in virtual meetings and what to do about them. Now, these are not in any particular order, but I will give you seven of the things that people are reporting not only to me, but also in the popular press, periodicals, and so forth about the most annoying behaviors that they are experiencing in virtual meetings. And then I'm going to give you the uh, what to do about them. All right, the first one, again, these are not in any particular order, but the first one I'm going to address is the person who does not know how to use the meeting platform. I don't care if you're on Zoom or WebEx or Microsoft Teams or some other platform, the person who does not know how to use the platform this long into it is annoying. So here's what to do about it. First off, I'm going to give you a few different suggestions. Um, First off, you can host informal learning sessions. Even this far into it, you can say, especially if you're the team leader or whether that's uh, in a formal capacity or even just somebody who is influential leading from the side, you can say, hey, uh, for any of those of you who want to learn a little bit more, some of the more advanced features or even the basic features of, say, Microsoft Teams or whatever platform you're using, join me on Thursday afternoon at 4 o'clock we're going to do a little informal learning session. We'll also do a little happy hour. I mean, you know, you could turn it into a coffee talk or a happy hour or something else as well. Um, but offer to do a little informal learning session where you're going to walk step by step through some of the most common tools within the platform. And then you can do some screen sharing, show everybody what you're doing, and then create a little activity where people need to use that tool or interact with the software that way themselves so that they get a chance to learn. Now, not everybody's gonna take you up on that. Some people are just too busy or they're not interested in technology or they're afraid of technology. Um, So another thing that you could do is create a list of links that link back directly to the the software suppliers tutorials on the web. So again, if it's Microsoft Teams, Microsoft has tons and tons of instructional videos, step-by-steps and how-tos that are the authoritative source on how to use any of their products. The same with Zoom, the same with WebEx, any particular product that you're using, and and always direct people back to the 
software suppliers tutorials. Don't just send them out to some you know random uh, YouTube video on the web. Send them to the source. So that, that's another thing. And, th and that's going to help the, the people who are maybe just a little bit embarrassed that they don't know or whatever. They're going to take the initiative then to follow up on some of those things themselves and learn it themselves. If you've got a particular person who is the source of all things trouble related to the platform, invite that person just to a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you directly and use the features together with them. Now, this might, depending on your situation, this might be under the guise of getting some work done, collaborating with them on something if your work intersects and you can come up with a good reason to meet one-on-one -on -one with that person. And then you're gonna encourage them to turn on their camera, encourage them to you know, write on the whiteboard or whatever features it is that they need some uh, coaching on. And you might do that again, under the guise of a meeting where you're collaborating, or depending on the politics and the person involved, you might say, hey, I would love to just set up 20 minutes with you where I step you through some of these things that you seem to be tripping over every time we have a meeting together and just do a very straightforward tutorial with them. There are a few ideas for our first annoying behavior of not knowing how to use the platform. All right, let's go on to the second annoying behavior in virtual meetings. And this is, oh, you're going to love this one, eating loudly during the meeting or any other annoying noises going on in the background and not muting. So again, like I did with the first one, I'll give you a few different strategies. The first one, you know, think about this like, Imagine you're in an auditorium and you're at a town hall meeting in your in your company back when it was safe to be face to face and the person behind you has this like loud bag of potato chips that they've just opened and they're munching the potato chips. If you're the person who turns around and respectfully asks them to quiet it down, put those away or whatever, all the people sitting nearby you are secretly quietly thanking you, silently thanking you. So be that person who would do that same thing in a face-to-face -face environment, but this time you're gonna PM the person. So you're gonna send them a direct message or a personal message right within the platform that you're using. And you know, you might make it a little bit lighthearted if you can, just because when you when you do it face to face, they might see you smile and they can tell you've got positive intent and that you're not really being a jerk. So if you're using just text only, as in a private message during the meeting, you're gonna wanna add some, whether it's a little humor, a little lighthearted humor or something to that message so that you don't come off as a total jerk. So you might text them something like, or PM, PM them something like, oh, my mouth is watering from the sound of your salt and vinegar chips. Man, can you turn it down a little? It's getting, I'm getting hungry over here. Um, oh, and by the way, it's distracting too. And so you might just tag that. Um, or, you know, again, depending on your style and that person's style, again, you kind of want to read the room here. If they can, if, if you can give them a very direct, clear, and specific message without doing any damage to the relationship, then by all means do that. So if it's somebody that you know well, who's making all that noise with their loud potato chips or whatever it is, you can just DM them and be like, dude, knock it off. That's annoying. Okay, so base your tone on the relationship that you have with the other person, as well as you might also want to think about where are you hierarchically on the org chart compared to them. So if this is your boss or your boss's boss, it's going to be a little bit more of a delicate matter and you can still do it, especially if you make it a little bit funny or lighthearted or whatever. Another way you could address this is you could establish some ground rules for your online meetings and have not eating be one of them. Now, you know, there's also the whole aspect of muting here. If the person is and absolutely does need to eat during the during the meeting, because I know a lot of people have back to back meetings in these days of work from home. And so maybe that's their only chance to have some lunch, then encourage them to mute. But I'm personally in favor of not muting during meetings, especially if it's a, a working meeting on a project or an intact team meeting. Now, I have a threshold of about a dozen people. If there's more than a dozen people on the meeting, then absolutely muting is great because you're just inviting a lot of background noise. But let's say it's the four or four or six of you who are an intact team and you meet once a week, you're standing weekly meeting. I'm in favor of not muting for that because then we hear the chuckles and the guffaws when somebody says something funny or sarcastic. Otherwise, if you have to take yourself off of mute to snicker at somebody's sarcastic remark, then you probably aren't going to take yourself off mute. You might still snicker at their sarcastic remark, but they don't then get the 
um, the favor of you actually snickering at them. And then they wonder, like, did my joke fall flat? Did anybody think that was funny? And so forth. So it creates more social intimacy and connectedness when intact teams or project teams have their microphones unmuted during the meeting. So maybe your ground rule is no eating during the meetings. Maybe your ground rule is, if it's a larger meeting, that you do mute during the meeting or whatever it is. Maybe your ground rule is we remain unmuted unless there is a significant background noise in your environment. All right, so eating loudly or other annoying noises and not muting. Okay, let's move on to number three. The third thing that is an annoying behavior in virtual meetings, multitasking or doing other work during the meeting. Oh my goodness. Let me be the first to tell you if you don't know this already, human beings, brains are single tasking machines. They are not multitasking machines. We cannot actually do more than one thing at a time. I mean, sure, we can chew gum and walk at the same time, but anything that takes cognition, especially significant cognition, we cannot do two of them at a time. So it might just be a matter of making sure the team knows we can't do, you know, humans are not equipped to do multitasking and we need your focus specifically on the work. Now I've done some experiments with teams trying to find out how much more effective they are if they do the meeting and only the meeting and that they're not doing email, not doing some other things. And my very unofficial data at this point is showing that meetings can get completed in 25 to 30% less time if people are not multitasking during the meeting. So you make it a ground rule. We're going to do this meeting and this meeting only. And if our meeting is scheduled to go for an hour and we get it done in 45 minutes because we didn't have to repeat ourselves because everybody was actually paying attention and not doing other work, answering emails, texting, whatever, then uh, you get those 15 minutes back after the meeting's over to, you know, to, to do some, to have some discretionary time during the day. Another thing related to multitasking though is ask yourself, does this person really need to be in the meeting if they are only there because their name's been on the invite to this meeting forever and they don't have anything to contribute, then maybe we just let them go. Or maybe if they just need to be there for part of the agenda, then you invite them to come for the portion of the meeting where they are, uh, you know, a subject matter expert or part of the decision making team or something like that. Because if they don't need to be there through the whole meeting, let's just invite them to the part they need to be there for so that we are not distracted by watching them on screen doing other work or, uh, you know, being, being distracted in some other way. So those are your tips for the multitasker who's doing other work during the meeting. The fourth annoying behavior is the person who is dominating the conversation. When we are meeting online and in remote environments, much stronger facilitation is required. And the reason for that is that when we're co-located, we have all of these social cues that are easy to read for most people, not for everybody, but for most people, it's pretty easy to read the room. So you see the person who wants to take a turn next, they're leaning in, they maybe have their hand out on the table and they're looking directly at the person who's currently talking because they want the next turn. And we can recognize that and we can yield the turn to them if we want to or, or not. So we have all these additional cues that we can use it when we are face-to-face, -face, eye contact, our gestures, our physical body posture, and all of that. Now, when we move into the virtual environment, even if we have our cameras on, which I strongly recommend, we still don't get all of those same cues. We can't tell as much if somebody is leaning in because they wanna take a turn. We can certainly see if somebody's disinterested because they're probably leaned back in their chair, or maybe they're doing that thing we were just talking about, multitasking, but it's a different animal. So, stronger facilitation is required. If you are the facilitator, a good thing to do is queue up other people to talk. And you can choose to put that person who's dominating the conversation in the queue or not, or send, queue them up last. So you might say something like, I know several of you have something to say about this. So um, let, me just talk, let me just ask those of you who this is squarely in your wheelhouse to address this first. Let's see, Emily, Terry, and Steve, can you, the, can the three of you in that order, and let's say in this case, Steve is the one who's dominating the conversation. We've put, we've cued him up to be last. So a couple of other people get to speak first. So if you are the facilitator, the onus is on you if you've got somebody dominating the conversation. I also would recommend that if this person is consistently dominating the conversation, that you talk with them outside of the meeting. You have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them where you ask them to dial it in a little bit and let other people participate more. And I can talk a little bit more about that here in a second. 
If you're not the facilitator, however, and a colleague is dominating the conversation, you can do some facilitation from the side. You don't have to be the meeting owner or the official meeting facilitator to jump in there and share some of the facilitation, especially if the facilitator isn't doing a good enough job. So it might sound something like this. You know, Jeff, I appreciate your ideas on this topic, and I know it's an area that Sherry also has really deep expertise in. Sherry, what's your position on this? Or what are we failing to consider about this? In this case, you're basically taking the turn from Jeff. You're taking it away from Jeff and handing it over to Sherry. And in that way, you're helping the the facilitator is probably going like, whoa, I should have been the one to do that, but that was masterful. So be ready with some of those attempts to hop in there, grab the turn away from the person who's taking too many turns or has too much airtime and hand it off to somebody else. It might not, sometimes it might be you, absolutely, but it's also a really masterful thing to do to be able to hand that turn to somebody else. Now, if it's the facilitator who is dominating the conversation, I have a slightly different tactic for you to take. Sometimes the facilitator is a subject matter expert on some of your agenda items. Ask if you can facilitate the meeting so that they can play full out as a subject matter expert. And you can remind them, hey, I know it's complicated to facilitate a meeting, especially when we're in in this online environment. I would love to facilitate any of the agenda items where you really want to play full out as a participant. Now, you may or may not add this next part. So this next part is that when you are the facilitator, you have more power in that meeting and because you're basically the one who's getting to decide who speaks and for how long. And if this person cares a lot about the agenda item, they may be, you know, inadvertently using their power ineffectively by taking too many turns, speaking too long and the like and the likes. Uh, Now, one other twist I want to put on this is Anita Woolley, who is a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, has done some fascinating research on turn taking in groups and teams. And her research, and I'll link to it in the show notes, her research is all about collective intelligence and like what is the the intelligence of a group of people. And what she's found is that groups of people tend to make better decisions and, and just generally be more intelligent together when everyone gets about the same amount of airtime, when everyone gets about the same amount of airtime. So about the equal number of turns and lengths of turns. Again, take a look in the show notes for that. This is workingconversations.com slash seven, episode seven. This episode is made possible by Instacart. If you haven't already started using Instacart, now is the time, my friend. Now, I'm the first one to say that I actually enjoy a trip to the grocery store. I really do. But you know what I like doing even better? Making this podcast. When I was deep in the development of this podcast, outlining and recording the first few episodes, my kids reminded me that they needed to eat. Instacart to the rescue. In absolutely record time, Magnolia, my Instacart shopper that day, delivered chicken nuggets, milk, avocados, fresh berries, and a host of other groceries we needed. When life gets busy, or when you just want to feel like royalty and have someone do it for you, there's Instacart. Get $10 off your first order when you sign up at workingconversations.com forward slash Instacart. Now, back to the show. All right, so those are some ideas for when somebody is dominating the conversation. Our fifth super annoying behavior in a uh, online meeting is when people do not turn on their video. It's most likely that they've gotten away with it this far. We're 10 months into a pandemic and they've gotten away with not turning their video on. They're probably thinking they're never going to have to turn their video on. Now, when I train managers on holding effective meetings in this online environment and amping up their productivity in the work from home environment, many of them admit to me that they have not stepped in to correct this behavior. They have, they let people get away with not turning their camera on. They admit to not taking the time to create a norm within their team that we have our cameras on. And so in some sense, it can be the manager's responsibility and we can place some, again, place that responsibility squarely on the shoulders of the managers. And and, and there's a variety of reasons that people will report for why they're not turning on their camera. So let's go through some of those reasons and, and assess whether these are legitimate reasons or debunk them if they're not. So the first one is bandwidth. People will say like, oh, you know, if I turn my camera on, it's going to tank the the whole meeting because my bandwidth is so bad. Well, give it a try and don't let them get away with that. Let's say, just say, hey, why don't you turn it on for a while and let's just check and see. And if indeed that is the case, we'll have you turn it back off. 
Now, odds are, if everybody else has their cameras on and the person who's claiming the bandwidth issue can watch and, and participate, you know, and see everybody and their screen isn't freezing up, then odds are that their bandwidth is probably fine. Now, right at the early part of the pandemic, when there was this very sudden shift to working from home, bandwidth absolutely was an issue. It was an issue for the various meeting platforms that you're using. It was an issue for many organizations. And in the intervening 10, 11 months, those organizations have fixed those problems. So unless the person is working you know, remotely from an area where they have poor internet connection, that might be legitimate, but still do some testing with that person to make sure that is the case. It might have been the case before and it's, and it's resolved now. Another thing that people will say is, oh, my, you know, my background, I, I just, my house is messy or my kids are homeschooling on the, you know, in the dining room behind me or whatever it is. Again, the platforms have come up, have come through with some really innovative solutions here. With Microsoft Teams, you can blur your background. And now with, even with WebEx, you can put up a virtual background. Uh, Zoom's had virtual background pretty much since day one. So there's all these different ways that you can make the background not an issue. You could also coach that person on, you know, turning their desk space around so that they've got just a blank wall behind them or something like that if the software does not support either blurring or a virtual background. Now, another one might be uh, personal grooming issues. So, and again, here, managers, I'm talking to you. This one is a, a team norm that needs to be set. Set expectations. Your expectations might be that everybody needs to be camera ready every day. Now, again, our personal grooming habits don't need to be exactly what they used to be when we were in the office every day. I mean, maybe you don't uh, do as much makeup or hair or whatever it is, but still do the basics so that you're not embarrassed to be seen. Again, managers and team leads, senior leadership, I'm talking to you, set a norm, set expectations, whether it's camera ready every day, or maybe it's camera ready on Tuesdays where we're, we have our project meeting or our intact team meeting. Or maybe you come up with a, we'll give you a 20 minute warning if you need to be camera ready. And really, really, each and every one of us should be camera ready in about two minutes. I mean, if you need to brush your hair or pull it back or put on a quick swipe of lipstick or mascara, uh, great. Or, you know, switch into a, a more professional shirt to be camera ready from the waist up. Absolutely. But you should be able to be camera ready in somewhere between two and five minutes. So create those norms. And, you know, and here's the other thing. You can always say this to the person who is not turning on their camera. Hey, Molly. Back when we were, you know, all in the office together, did you realize that every time we gathered together in a meeting, we could see you? <laughs> we could see you then. We saw you every single day when we were in the office together and we want to see you now. So, you know, you can have some fun with it. But remind them that you used to see them every single day. All right, let's talk about number six. So the number six annoying behavior in our virtual team meetings. And that is forgetting to take yourself off mute. All right, again, I spoke about mute before, but unmute, have unmute, being unmuted as the norm so that everybody is unmuted all the time. Again, this is for a smaller meeting, you know, a dozen people or less, this tends to work good. And then you could have people mute if they have a, an excessive amount of background noise. Sometimes you might just have one offender, one person who forgets to take themselves off mute. Everybody else has it figured out, but you got this one person. Talk to that person about, you know, again, offline, not during the meeting, but talk to that person about using a post-it note or some other physical representation of being on mute so that they have, you know, not just the little red circle with the slash through it over their microphone down in the bottom left corner of their screen or wherever it is. Talk to them about putting some other physical representation. Again, a post-it note works great with the word mute on it, and they've got that sticking up on their on their desktop somewhere, and then when they want to take a turn, they move that and they unmute themselves. Okay, on to our last one, number seven. The seventh annoying behavior in virtual meetings is people being unprepared. For those of you who are prepared for the meeting and you've come ready to roll up your sleeves and work hard and get some agenda items across the finish line, it can be mind blowing to have people there who are unprepared. So let me give you a few tips. The first is there must be a meeting agenda. If there isn't a meeting agenda, then it's really hard for somebody to come to that meeting prepared. So there needs to be a typed up agenda. Ideally, that's going to reside right within the meeting notice so that it is 
inexcusable for not having it. You know, oh, I didn't download the attachment. Let's not have it be an attachment. Or if it is an attachment, you know, just make that the norm and make sure people know that they must download that agenda and have it open during the meeting. Also, that that agenda needs to go out 24 hours before the meeting at least. And then put people's names in the agenda next to the items that you're expecting their participation on. And prompt everybody to be reading that agenda. Again, get that normalized that people read the agenda right when it goes out. And then, you know, here's the funny thing. People show up to a meeting very differently if their name is next to an agenda item and they've actually read that agenda item and they see their name there. They're like, holy smokes, I got to be ready to talk about that issue because I'm listed as a subject matter expert or I'm listed as the person who's going to lead the discussion or lead the decision making process. So once you've got people's names in the agenda, the agenda going out well before the meeting and created normative behavior that people read that agenda, you're going to have absolutely no excuses for somebody to be unprepared for your meeting. All right, there they are, the top seven annoying behaviors in virtual meetings and what to do about them. If this episode was helpful for you, please share it with a friend. And again, if you want to see this list, and uh, also get the links to some of the resources I mentioned, hop on over to workingconversations.com forward slash seven for episode number seven. Take good care. I'll see you next time. And until then, get after it. Thanks so much for listening. If you like what you're hearing on the podcast, head on over to Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts and give us five stars and a quick review. It really makes a difference and it keeps us bringing you valuable content that you can put into play in your life. I'm Dr. Janelle Anderson, and this is Working Conversations.